good morning everyone and welcome to the Adult Sunday School with Drew and I. And we've been doing this for so long that we've actually unintentionally uh, been able to sync our wardrobes pretty much exactly with each other. It's true. Um, so I think we are in such a rhythm that we are just pure, purely synthesized with each other. What did you have for breakfast? Did we have the same thing? <laughs> uh, I didn't have breakfast. Did you have breakfast? I only had a coffee. Okay, yeah, I had coffee. Coffee for breakfast. There you go. Which means and I need lunch <laughs> at this stage of the day. So we're going to film this really quickly. <laughs> be in some taco truck with him in a few minutes. And <clears throat> so as a follow-up to Drew's sermon last week, we're just going to talk about um, some questions you may have around Samson. Because Drew, Drew did an awesome sermon, but it wasn't sort of the typical themes that we normally wrestle with with Samson. So we'll, so we'll spend a little bit of time talking about Samson. And then we're going to go to the, the crystal vase um, and pick out uh, a question that... And one of you in the in the congregation emailed to me this week. So, Drew, do you want to um, kick us off by introduction to, um, I guess first just a little bit of what kind of inspired you to take the route you did with the text, and then we can get into like what are some of the questions you think we would more commonly wrestle with um, when it comes to characters like Samson. Yeah. Um, well, y you all may have noticed that um, I, I was given the topic, or, or chose, it, or we, we chose it together, but um, I had the character of Samson for the sermon on Sunday, and then in the sermon itself, I, I sort of skirted around the character of Samson, um, focused more on Manoah and uh, Manoah's wife, who are Samson's parents eventually, um, and the, the sort of announcement of Samson's birth. Um, but I, so, so there were a couple of reasons that I uh, chose to kind of skirt the character of Samson himself. Um, the first was that I, I kind of realized as I was reading the few chapters about Samson that these stories are like ones that we often tell in Sunday school, mm -hmm. like the children's Sunday school and those kinds of things. Um, so they're stories that are like at least vaguely familiar to us. We know Samson was this really strong man. We might even remember that he uh, took this Nazarite vow. His hair wasn't supposed to be cut. He has this encounter with Delilah. She cuts his hair. We kind of know the contours of Samson's story. And then I found as I was reading that announcement of the birth narrative um, that that was part of Samson's story that I hadn't remembered very well. Um, and, and I'm sure I've read it before, but hadn't remembered it very well. I was struck by the resonances with other birth announcements in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Um, so in the sermon, I mentioned like Hannah, uh, who, who is a, the, the announcement of Samuel um, is made to her after she is barren. Um, Sarah, of course, is barren uh, up until the, the promised child of Isaac is, uh, is announced to her. Um, and then all the way through to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and, and Elizabeth, her cousin, who receive birth announcements mm -hmm. like this. Um, so I was struck by that and kind of wanted to um, tease that out a little bit. So that was a sort of positive motivation. The negative motivation mm -hmm. um, was that as I was reading the stories of Samson's life, I was reminded in a fresh way that these are really strange stories. Um, that, that Samson is a part of. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have separate stories about um, Samson wanting to marry different women at different times, which is a little bit odd for us um, in the 21st century to sort of get our heads around. Um, there is, like, Samson sort of develops into this strongman persona, mm -hmm. um, and we have this prophecy at the beginning of the Samson narrative that he, that he will be the one who's going to deliver Israel. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of expecting him to step into that role, but the ways that he steps into that role are really um, sometimes even horrifying. So there's this story um, in Judges 14 where Samson uh, is, is, I don't know, gambling, it seems like, with a group of, of uh, Philistine men, um, Philistine men. And uh, Samson bets them that they won't be able to figure out this riddle. And days go by and the men are trying to figure out this riddle. They can't figure it out. They finally um, get Samson's fiance to convince Samson to tell her what the answer to the riddle is. Then Samson's fiance, who is a Philistine woman, tells the men, they come to Samson and say, here's the answer to your riddle. The loser of the bet had to give the other 30 sets of garments, 30, 30 sets of new cloth mm -hmm. for, for clothes, mm -hmm. for garments. Uh, so Samson's lost the bet now. What Samson does is he goes down the road, finds 30 men, kills them, 
strips them of their clothes, and brings those clothes back to settle his bet with mm. these Philistine men. And you're just going, what? what? <laughs> I mean, it's, just, it's, right. it's a strange story. Mm. Um, Samson ends up killing a, a, a thousand men with a, with a donkey's jawbone. Mm-hmm. Again, just like Samson comes across in, in certain parts of his story as like bloodthirsty, um, revenge seeking. Um, he, he's very vengeful um, and, and, and sort of takes things very personally on himself. Like you've slighted me, therefore I'm going to kill these 30 guys or I'm going to kill these thousand men or, or whatever it is. Um, and, and that part of his character held in tension with him being the judge of that time period, the, the deliverer of the people of Israel, is a really strange dissonance. It was for me. And so there was a, there was a sense in which I kind of thought, in a short sermon, pre-recorded and all these things, it's hard to get into those right, issues right, and right. really fully talk about it. And, and as you're talking, I'm kind of thinking on the, the different contrast between the, the leaders of the Bible shines on to say like this is the leaders you should aspire after mm-hmm. and then like what are the leaders that the people actually were drawn to yeah and so you have like the davids of this world who at the end of the day were slight beyond their flaws were said to be um i'm standing in the eyes of god mm-hmm. and but like what waned in like their favors with the people through their personal failures and their their military failures yeah but then you have guys like samson that are just totally left field um, and don't resemble any of the godly characteristics, but amassed a, a following, and the people loved them for what they did for the nation. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. And I think that it, there was a good reminder for me as I was thinking through this that um, there's not a single character mm-hmm. in the whole of Scripture that we're supposed to take wholeheartedly as a role model, except for Jesus. Mm-hmm. Like Jesus is the only character that we get in the whole of the Bible mm-hmm. that we should say, if, if, if Jesus did it, if we're mm-hmm. seeing Jesus do it, that is a role, that is a model for us. We mm-hmm. should try to be like Jesus. Um, at various points, we think to ourselves, like, I want to be like David in that I want to slay Goliath. Right. I want to be like Samson in that I want to be strong in the Lord. I want to have the spirit of the Lord in me, and therefore it gives me strength. We can sort of metaphorize those things Mm -hmm. in in certain ways that might be helpful in specific situations, but Samson's not a role model for us. David's not a role model for us. Moses, Abraham, like what we could, or go into the New Testament, Peter, Paul, all of these people had real flaws that we would not want to model Mm -hmm. our lives after. Um, and, And so that's a good reminder for us that like, even if we kind of, resonate with a character in the Bible and think, oh, I, I see a lot of my own story in this character's story. That's good for us to find mm-hmm. those resonances and connect with the mm-hmm. biblical story in that way. But we also ought to remember that like, we don't want our lives to look mm-hmm. like any character in the Bible except for Jesus. I, I heard a local rabbi here, Rabbi Resnick, who's a rabbi in Palm Beach, give a, give a little sermon on um, his, one of a Jewish reading of Abraham and Isaac yeah. and the sacrifice there. And, and his point was that um, we often say this, this is, we should model Abraham's faith. Right. It's like, you got to have faith to be willing to sacrifice yourself. Right. And like, I've heard people say that. Sure. Which, on one hand, is madness. Yeah. It's illegal. <laughs> and ends the degree. And it's just madness. It's actually possibly just right. insane. Right. right. But, but the rabbi was, it's illegal. It's madness. The whole promise of the people of Israel is dependent on Isaac. So God, his view was, and I still don't know, like it still doesn't sit fully easy with, mm. with me. Sure. But his point was, was, it was a test of sorts from God to say that you have permission to wrestle with me. Right. You have permission to be in dialogue with me and you have permission to um, be like, no, that's craziness. Right. And, and I think for me, that, that gives us permission to to be, and I don't think God would play games with us. That yeah. was kind of the issue I had with, with that. But but I, but I, but I think that the, the the test is, are we really wrestling with the cause of God in our life? Or are we just like nose to the millstone, just following it? Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Because you can do it without necessarily having the the transformative process of it. Yeah, you can just sort of like blindly fall. Yeah, and and the near sacrifice of Isaac is such a good example mm-hmm. in this same kind mm-hmm. of way. 
Um, and, and for me, like the, um, I, I've heard that Jewish interpretation, mm. I think from Rabbi Resnick as well. Mm. Um, and it is so interesting and I, it was helpful for me mm. to like take that in, wrestle with it. Mm. Um, the, the point I think is so helpful about mm. it is maybe not the specific interpretation itself, mm. but the idea that the whole purpose of God's test is to sort of bring Abraham into a, a, another or maybe fuller relationship with God. Mm -hmm. It's actually to say, Abraham, you're going to wrestle with me, mm -hmm. and that's because the mm -hmm. two of us are in relationship mm -hmm. together. Um, I think the idea in that story in particular is, Abraham, if the child of promise was taken away from you, if all the benefits of the covenant that you have with me, if I'm God, if all the benefits of the covenant are taken away, would you still want a relationship with me? Mm -hmm. Even if it meant the horror of your son being taken from you, would you still want a relationship with me? And that sort of relational idea, I think you're exactly right, gives us that freedom to wrestle with these passages that are difficult, mm -hmm. to wrestle with these stories and say, you know what, I think Samson was wrong in taking out his revenge mm -hmm. on 30 seemingly innocent mm -hmm. people to take their clothes to then settle another right. bet. Like th that, that, yeah, I don't think Samson was right in doing that. That also doesn't preclude Samson from being used by God to deliver the people of Israel. And I think that this is also connected to uh, um, some of how we've talked about how we read the Bible. Yes. And, and I think if we say that, okay, Samson killed a thousand people with a jawbone, um, that's not good. In, in some ways that has like an inference on like the truth of the Bible. Right. So if there's like a moral sort of greenness or, or in this case like blackness to what happened and, and like, we, we can't like feel the need to like really kind of critique that without feel like we're, we're stepping into this territory of questioning like the truth of like what happened yeah yeah the interpretive words we use um yeah. in like academic circles is that um, most of these stories mm -hmm are descriptive rather than prescriptive. Mm -hmm. So they're telling a story, they're telling us what happened. They're not necessarily for the ancient Israelite people mm -hmm. or for us in the mm -hmm. 21st century telling us what ought to be, right. what should have happened. Mm -hmm. They're telling us what did happen. Um, and in the midst of what did happen, mm -hmm. Samson being a vengeful, bloodthirsty sort of character, mm -hmm. in the midst of what did happen, God is bringing deliverance mm -hmm. God is bringing salvation. God is bringing redemption. God is faithful right. in the midst of a whole lot of unfaithfulness. Mm -hmm. One of the things I said in the sermon was that we've got to remember that hanging over the whole book of Judges is this cycle of the people of Israel being unfaithful mm -hmm. and God offering faithfulness in turn every time they're unfaithful. God brings a deliverer. Every time they're unfaithful, God brings them someone who will, who will usher them mm -hmm. out of whatever the trial that they're in is. Um, and that's the story of the Old Testament. It's the ultimate fulfillment in the person of Jesus um, that despite the unfaithfulness of humanity mm -hmm. over and over again, God is still faithful. Mm -hmm. And that's the overarching theme I see in all these Old Testament stories, which can help us to step outside of the nitty gritty details of like, should Samson have killed these people or whatever. It was helpful. Mm -hmm. This is it's different, uh, but a, a question I'm thinking. And in, in terms of the people who we, if we, the heroes of the faith and the sort of like great villains, but that's some good things, and we see them as sort of archetypes to follow. And how do you think this plays out in our in our sort of following of celebrity pastors and sort of Christian thinkers? And in the terms of if we really want to engage with the truth of scripture and the truth of theology mm -hmm. and following people who embody a certain um, viewpoint, and um, do, do you think there's any danger in slipping into a similar book, like in a different territory there? Of, um, yeah. yeah, no, I, I mean, I, th I definitely think there is. Um, I, I think there are a lot of men and women in the 21st century mm -hmm. who are writing some really good theology, mm -hmm. um, really like high level academic doctrine mm -hmm. sort of theology um, and really good like grounded practical theology. Mm -hmm. I've like read it in, in all kinds of uh, ways and seen people talking about it um, and, and all of that is super helpful. I think we should take what is helpful mm -hmm. from those. Um, I think the danger is if we, if we somehow, and most of the time we do this unconsciously, we start to equate 
a certain thinker or a certain theologian or a certain pastor's view of things as scripture. We would never say it that way because it's ridiculous when you say it out loud. We would never say it that way. But what we end up doing is we think, we forget that every pastor, theologian, mm. um, thinker is interpreting the scripture and that their interpretation, while it may be very good, while it may be very sound, is, is one interpretation and is um, influenced by their own experiences, by their mm. own cultural mm. context, by all of these things, um, and therefore is not scripture itself. And that we might find that someone else on another end of a spectrum or a, from another perspective or viewpoint has a different interpretation, mm -hmm. which is also sound, which is also helpful to us, which we also need to hear, mm -hmm. even if sometimes we end up disagreeing with some of those interpretations. Mm -hmm. As we've been talking about Rabbi Resnick's interpretation mm -hmm. of the Abraham and Isaac story, we're both kind of in a place of like, that's a really interesting interpretation, really helps me to think about mm -hmm. the text better. It helps me wrestle with the text more, that for me is a huge value, right? And I definitely the first time I was just triggered when I heard it. Live. Sure, I was like, what? Mm. Ah. And like some, like my body tensed up. Yeah, the, like, and, and it elicited this sort of like visceral reaction. But then, like you said, I haven't like thought about it. You're like, huh? Like, this is helpful. Mm -hmm. And I think the overarching arch of like how we deal with these characters, how we deal with this text, is it's much more gray than it is black and white. Yeah, and and we have to be able to. And the whole like critique the past and like hold the good mm -hmm. and say like where is like the middle ground where is like God saying because we can't just like commit to one one point and say this is where we are yeah. and ignore everything else just to like maintain this yeah yeah and and I think just to kind of bring it back it, 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 that all just comes back to the idea that we're reading stories that that stories aren't aren't really black and white mm -hmm. my story's not your story's mm -hmm. not Samson's story's not. Um, stories aren't black and white. Um, and so when we're reading these stories, mm -hmm. one of the questions I'm continually asking myself is something to the effect of, what, how is this story revealing more of the character of God? Well, what is this story revealing mm -hmm. about God? Which is when you can kind of take that step back and say, well, God is being faithful in the midst of some craziness that is happening in the land of Canaan and the people of Israel. Um, God's being faithful. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's something I definitely want to hang on to. Um, and that's something that also gets repeated over and over again. We have other places in scripture that would warn us against vengeful action mm -hmm. like Samson is mm -hmm. taking. So, so we can hold those in tension mm -hmm. and say, actually, yeah, I, I get it. Samson's not necessarily um, upstanding in everything he's doing here. But the overarching thing mm -hmm. is God's faithfulness. Mm -hmm. um, and in the midst of all these stories, we get that recurring theme over and over. Great. And do you want to go ahead and pick the question for us? Yeah, let me have a, let me have a look here. All right, this one's a little long. It's all right. You ready? Um, okay. So uh, this comes from someone who is reading The Nature and Destiny of Man by Reinhold Niebuhr. So uh, props to whoever's reading The Nature and Destiny of Man by Reinhold Niebuhr. Um, and he says that, uh, or he or she says, um, Niebuhr seems to be wrestling with our predicament of being children of nature, but also a part or outside of nature. Because of our theological understanding of God, our advancement as toolmakers, and our capacity for doing horrendous things. Mm -hmm. uh, this book, Niebuhr's book, was written in the aftermath of two world wars and the Cold War. So what can we take from it with what's going on today? Mm -hmm. There's some good questions in sure. there. Sure. So I think one of the questions is, how, similar to what we've seen with Samson, how in our own lives can we, can we hold um, our ability to do evil and our ability to, uh, and that's Niebuhr's phrase is toolmaker. Yes. Essentially, like how are we agents of the kingdom of God on earth? Mm -hmm. So how can we hold those both in our personal lives? We sometimes say co-creators, co don't we? We talk about that a little yeah. bit in terms and of then, the way we collaborate mm -hmm. with God. Now yeah. I think on like a zoomed out level, um, how do we reconcile and sort of the transformation and building of God's kingdom on earth with so in some places you can have hospitals getting built, orphanages getting built and people's lives being changed 
and then a thousand miles away somewhere there's a genocide happening. Yeah. How can how can all or hospitals and orphanages are being bombed? Right. <laughs> a thousand how, miles away. Built like, here and bombed over here. Right. How how can we reconcile like a sovereign God and and Christians' ability to participate in the kingdom transformation with these polar seemingly polarized and contradictory things happening at the same time? Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Um, and I think it starts a little bit with um, this idea that I think Niebuhr is getting at of humanity's place in creation. Um, so in scripture, we have these ideas of um, humanity being mm-hmm. a part of the created order, a mm-hmm. part of creation, um, and therefore most specifically not God. Mm-hmm. So there's God and there's creation mm-hmm. in scripture. Like in some ways it's as simple as that. And so in that sense, humanity is part of the created order. Um, but we also have this, this idea in scripture that humans are set apart or special in some way among the created order. Um, we have this idea of humans being placed just lower than the angels mm-hmm. kind of a thing, um, but, but clearly set apart in terms of their purpose be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. These these are the the language of Genesis of humanity being set apart from everything else Mm -hmm. that is created, um, where we find ourselves able to collaborate with God in some profound way, even though it's all through the power of God in us, um, but able to collaborate with God um, in some way, uh, but also by virtue of free will, able to do like, the, the atrocities that would lead to and come out of two world wars, mm-hmm. the Cold War, like all these sort of geopolitical things wrapped up in the idea of the horrendous mm-hmm. things that humanity can do. And Niebuhr, as a German, obviously is wrestling with this, not as just like a personal thing, but as a, like, how do I navigate the world now after, like, our country becoming a pariah twice? Yeah. And then half of your country, again, involved in um, the Soviet Union in the fallout of the Cold War. So, and then just again, it's the deeply personal, like the personal waves of that motivation to wrestle with that question. Yeah. And then sort of bigger theological, like this is a question that people have wrestled with for thousands of years. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think for me, one of the things I have to come back to it is personal and individual in mm-hmm. terms of um, I want to always have a view of myself mm. that includes my ability and opportunity to be a co-creator with God mm. with my capacity for doing evil. Mm-hmm. Mm. And that, I don't ever want to weight one of those more than the other, honestly. Sure. Like, yeah. I, think, I think there's a danger on both sides there where if, um, if I'm only really viewing myself positively mm. and only viewing mm. myself for my... Uh, capacity to help build God's kingdom, um, then I will be entirely blinded to my own sin, um, and I will minimize it entirely, um, right. and that can cause me to abuse, marginalize, oppress other people um, by way of minimizing my own flaws. Um, likewise, I don't want to do the opposite. I don't want to minimize my capacity for being a part of building God's kingdom Mm -hmm. and instead maximize my own flaws and my own capacity for evil. Um, I mean, we've talked about Martin Luther before. This is one of the things that in some of Luther's writings I see Luther doing is putting too much emphasis on his own capacity for evil um, and therefore sort of just... um, only focusing on that and just bypass the human experience altogether and just look to God on for sure and and it gives you such a terrible view of yourself that you rob yourself of the benefits of being a part of God's kingdom and you also mm. rob other people of the benefits of you being a part of their community mm. because you've only just isolated yourself in your own box mm. of evil capacity mm. um, and so both of those have to be held in tension all the time um, and I don't necessarily think I'm great at it all the time, mm-hmm. but I think that's an important thing for us to try to do. Um, and that idea I think Niebuhr is trying to get at and wrestle mm-hmm. with, how are those two things true and held in tension in each of us all the time? Mm-hmm. I think it's the flip is also true, that evil people evil people can, can still do good things for the kingdom of God. 
when you think like just biblically, like Nebuchadnezzar paid for the building of the temple. Sure. Nero's persecution of Christians actually spread Christianity because Christians left Rome. Yeah. And where they left to, they started up Christian communities. Yeah. So so it's that in in both it, the the Holy Spirit, despite of our ability to sin and, and participate in evil structures, that we, we can be transformed. And in God's sovereignty, that um, those that would appear on the face just to only do evil, that, that there, there, there can be byproducts of that that part play into and participate in the king building of God's kingdom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's good. Great. Well, please continue to um, send in your questions. And we are um, committed to doing this as long as we need to. And we'll do it as long as you have questions. As long as you have questions. Um, and as long as... Uh, Cam Carters are still around and we still have electricity <laughs> in this dystopian society we now live in. <laughs> but uh, we miss you, we really do. We hope that you're well and um, we really do appreciate your feedback um, and engagement with um, the material Drew and I have been cranking out. So we look forward to seeing you soon and uh, keep on keeping on. Thank you. <laughs>